This is Horror Podcast. Welcome to This Is Horror, a podcast for readers, writers, and creators. I'm Michael David Wilson, and every episode alongside my co-host Bob Pastorella, we chat with masters of horror about writing, life lessons, creativity, and much more. Now today's guest is Richard Kadri, the author of the Sandman Slim series, amongst other things. And this is the second of a two-part conversation, though, as always, you can listen to these in any order. Now, in this episode, we talk about Richard's Coop novels. We talk a little bit about his collaborative process. We talk about comic writing and a lot, lot more. But before any of that, a little bit of an advert break. Being an independent publisher, we are just like you. We share the same passion, the same love for horror fiction. We believe in the incredible work being created, unnoticed by the mainstream. And we want to share it with the world. We are the Sinister Horror Company. Malene by Josh Schlossberg from DT Publishing. The absent mindedness, the nonsensical ramblings, the blank stares. Ward heirs, physically disabled and confined to his Jersey Shore home, can only watch in dismay as his beloved wife, Malene, slips further and further into dementia. Until finally, Ward uncovers the dark force behind Malene's decline and must plumb the depths of sacrifice and selfishness to reclaim his wife and preserve humanity's future. Find Malene in paperback, hardcover, ebook, or audiobook online or at a bookstore near you. Okay, well, with that said, here it is. It is part two of the conversation with Richard Cadry on This Is Horror. So now that Sandman Slim is done, what is next for you? Well, I just finished my first collaborative novel with Cassandra Kaw. It's called uh, The Dead Take the A-Train. It's set in New York. It's about a psychic operative named Julie Cruz, who is down on her luck. People are taking advantage of her. She's broke. She's trying to move ahead in the psychic operative world of New York, the underground of New York's, you know, um, exorcist, ghost killing, monster killing world. But people take advantage of her, her ex lover takes credit for a lot of her kills and she's just not getting ahead and she decides one day i need a guardian angel and she goes looking for one and once she does that all hell breaks loose in new york hmm. we're calling it basically atomic blonde meets uh, hellraiser <laughs> what a combination fuck I'm so in. i'm so fucking in on this <laughs> <laughs> so we finished the first draft we're about to start uh tearing that apart and rewriting it and that will be out not next year but this, so not 22 it'll probably be out in 23 unless something changes in the schedule mm. it'll probably be out in 23 so we're going to do at least two of those and we finished the first one it was a lot of fun to work on I've never done a collaborative novel before, so there's a lot of, there was a learning curve and a lot of fun throwing chapters back and forth. Because my prose style and Cassandra's are almost polar opposites. Yeah. I'm very, I'm very minimalist and uh, Cassandra is very, um, it's very dense, Mm. very, not poetic but very complicated prose. So there was a certain amount of jostling back and forth, trying to figure out, well, what's that middle ground between our two styles? And we found it, and that didn't take too long. 
So uh, I think the book will be, it's a bit closer to Cass's prose style than mine, but I'm really happy with it. I think we balanced it out well and people will, people will enjoy both the story and the prose itself. Yeah, and what did working on a collaborative novel look like logistically? As I've worked on a couple, so I'm wondering, I mean, was it a case of like bouncing things back and forth, going over each other's drafts, or I mean, were there a lot of calls? Talk me through that a little bit. Yeah, Cass had this process that I guess... Gaiman and Terry Pratchett had used for um, um, Good Omens. And that it was that bounce, like, you know, I'll send you my stuff and you rewrite it till you're happy, then you send it back to me. I'll rewrite that and I'll add stuff and then we'll send it back to you. And so it just sort of grew out of that. So it was a lot of bouncing stuff back and forth. And the fact is, Cass and I know each other well enough and neither one of us is so ego-driven that either was got huffy with the changes so we were able to find our way into a balanced a balanced narrative pretty quickly so i was really happy about that and i think we're i think we're both pretty happy with the book uh at the moment it means it needs a ton of work of course because we were learning along the way and you know any book uh any first draft is going to need to get beaten up with a with a pipe wrench for a while and right. a collaborative, a collaborative one, which is more complicated may need even a little more of a, a brutal working over. But I think, I think people are going to be happy with it in the end. The ironic thing about the book when we first conceived it is setting it in New York because the first thought was we both, neither of us lives in New York. We both love New York. Let's set a book there so we have excuses to go visit. Mm. Great. Great plan. Love it. Then COVID hit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it just shut everything down. So there was no travel. So all we were working on for part of the book was our memory and, and bothering New Yorkers. of like, is this where this is? What does this street look like these days? Because I can't, I wasn't able to go there. You know, what's the subway line? Oh, What's the subway line along this route look like right now? How long does it take to get from here to there? So there was a lot of annoying stuff like that, but you know, with things opening up again, we're going to get to go do a lot more New York stuff in the, in the near future. So we'll use a lot of that in the next, in the next book, but with luck, we'll be able to maybe get back to New York enough to, you know, rewrite some of this book, with our own impressions in mind and not one stolen from our friends. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, what awful timing, but as you say, I mean, with a 2023 release, hopefully there is time now and things are opening up, so... Yeah. Yeah, you can finally go back to New York. Yeah, I mean, tons of friends there. I'm from New York originally, so I love going back there. Manhattan's my favorite place. So, yeah, I'm a happy boy back there. So it will be terrific to go back and see the city for real and to go to the places we talk about in the book mm. and, you know, walk that ground. But I have, you know, but our friends are old school New York enough that if we asked them a straight up question, what is, I remember this corner. What it, does it still look like that? And they'll mm. say, no. What you want is two blocks over. Yeah, you know, like that area got, got gentrified. What you want is a couple of blocks off that's still kind of, uh, you know, people have kind of forgotten about. It's a little, mm. little, uh, little more run down. Yeah. Did you spend most of your childhood living in New York then? No, I only spent the first 10 years of my life. Then my mom, for various reasons, took took us off to uh, Houston, Texas. Mm. So I lived the next 10 years in Texas, which um, were much crazier than New York. And then when I, then after 10 years of that, some friends of mine moved to LA to go, we want to write for TV and movies. And I said, sounds good to me. I just packed all my shit in my crappy little car and just drove to LA, took a couple of days 
but I arrived, I arrived in LA with, I, <laughs> it was a kind of a spontaneous move. It's the kind of thing you do when you're, when you're like 20 years old or mm-hmm. early twenties, where like literally I just put my stuff in a car, drove to LA and kind of went, once I got there, it's like, well, I have a few hundred bucks and nowhere to stay. I should have thought this through. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I slept in my car a couple of nights, a few nights. Back when you could do that, it was long enough ago where you could do the finest side street and sleep in your car and not get murdered or have the car ripped apart. And I tracked down some friends of mine who were living there. So I got to couch surf for a while before I could get my own place. So, but you know, like I said, it all worked out. I was in LA for years and I loved LA and that's why so much of my work is, is set there. That's why Stark is set there and uh, some of my stories uh, I lived in San Francisco longer than I lived in LA, but I've said I haven't written as much about San Francisco for, for the reason that I feel like San Francisco is kind of, it's, it's an easier, prettier place to write about. That doesn't appeal to me. Mm-hmm. LA's a mess. Hollywood's a mess. And I find that much more appealing. Besides someone like, I kind of feel like in terms of fantasy, Christopher Moore kind of owns San Francisco. Right. Uh, so it was like, well, Chris, and he's a friend. Um, it's like, nah, I'm going to stay out of his playground because he does it so well that I'm not going to worry about it. I'm just going to, I'm going to go other places. So, yeah, stuff set in LA, stuff, uh, stuff now is set in New York. I'm trying to, trying to go to other places I love, but, but uh, aren't. Yeah, you know, I, I uh, are in San Francisco. I've written two books about San Francisco, and uh, that's kind of all I think I need to write. Mm-hmm. I wonder what were some of the crazy things that you experienced in Houston, Texas? A lot of violence. <laughs> a lot of violence, a lot of drinking, a lot of drugs. Um, you know... Uh, Back when I moved there, I was a weird kid from New York, and so that didn't go over great with the, with the Cowboys. Right. So I, I had to sort of find my way into that world. And I was always, you know, in, in the long term, it was good because I was on the outside and I kind of stayed on the outside. But I was able to find myself into the edges of different worlds. I learned to survive. I could take on personas which meant I could move in different circles. So I never got in with the Cowboys, but I was a good enough student that I could be, I could present myself as nice enough to hang out with the other smart kids. But then at night, I had a whole other set of friends who were in downtown who were in the Montrose area. And that was the, it was the gay part of town. It was the drug part of town. It was the art part of town. And I could go do that at night because that was closer to my heart uh, and I could I could be that person at night and I could be someone else during the day. So I think that helped my fiction in the idea of taking on other personalities and like how does one exist in these different worlds and imagining my way into that and, you know, doing a, a well enough job that I survived it all. Yeah, I can confirm all that because I'm, I'm an hour and a half away from Houston and every single time I've ever been to Houston, I have seen so much violence. Yeah. To this day, I'm really surprised by it. I I thought that would have died out a while ago, but it's still, yeah, it's, it's fucking crazy crazy. place. Yeah. I've had more guns in my face in Houston Mm -hmm. that, that I can count and, and not even, not even bad reasons. Just, I had this drunk, come up to me in a car wash and stick a 45 in my face and go, I just got a new gun. <laughs> he was, he was the happiest, <laughs> friendliest drunk you ever want to meet, but he was a happy, friendly drunk with a 45 about two inches from my nose. Yeah. You know, so e- even, even the nice people are going to fucking kill you there. <laughs> yeah. And it's, now, I mean, I haven't been in a while because of COVID and stuff like that. Yeah. I, I'm not really big into travel anyway. But, uh, you know, the last time I went and we, it was for, a, it was for a meeting and we ended up going to a restaurant. I didn't talk to nobody. 
Yeah. And they were like, they're all talking. I'm like, hey, you're, we're, they're like, man, we're in Texas. I'm like, I understand that, man, but we're in Houston. Yeah. <laughs> you're going to end up saying the wrong thing to the wrong person and you're going to get fucked up. <laughs> Yeah, that, that's that's my memory of uh, my childhood. I'm, I'm, it's funny to hear that there there are those aspects to it still. It's supposed mm-hmm. to be a big cosmopolitan city these days, but I can see that part of Houston not never dying out. No, and the Montrose area was like you know that's where where we all went out. I mean, she you, you get out there, you got West Timer, you go out the Mont, you know, Numbers. Sure. Went into all that stuff, man. Sure. Uh, and then as you 20- got a little older, you go check out bands at Fitzgerald's and stuff like that. And, yeah. You know, we had local local bands that did got a, got a gig at Fitzgerald's. You'd have to go. It's like, well, fuck, man. That's like that's like the big league, you know. Yeah, absolutely. What was that other club? Million Dollar City Dump. Clubs are concerned. Yeah, mm-hmm. I, I I don't know. I, I wonder what the, what Montrose is like. I'm sure it's all gentrified, all the hell. Mm-hmm. From what I've heard, yeah. Yeah. I, it was fun when it was run down and it was just, it was just run by crazy people and artists and, um, yeah, occult, occult bookshops where they would take a photo of you and show you, you are, uh, things like that. Yeah. That's man. That's, those were the days, but yeah, things have gotten crazy now, yeah. but you know, you can still go down the, the, you still go down the highway there and you can find that place and get you and go get, hang out in strip plug and eat steak. So yeah, <laughs> ain't wrong. Well, now that I, now that I'm in, <laughs> I'm in Austin these days, and what I discovered through friends is the gas station restaurant from Texas Chainsaw Massacre still exists. Oh yeah, and you can go there and you can buy barbecue and you can hang around and take photos and hell yes, I'm gonna get some friends and we're gonna take a Texas Chainsaw Massacre <laughs> vacation out there <clears throat> buy some uh buy some of that barbecue bring it home uh, yeah. i don't even care if it's not the best barbecue right i just want some te- i just want some texas chainsaw barbecue yeah oh yeah well i mean as well as collaborating with Cass, you've written a number of comics written on a number of comics such as mm-hmm. heavy metal and lucifer hellblazer so I mean, I'm wondering how does that approach to writing kind of differ from your novel writing and what are some of the commonalities and differences? Well, the first thing I uh, had to learn with comics, I had to trust with comics, was the artist. First time I tried to write comics many years earlier, they were very wordy long captions, long sets, you know, um, um, bits of dialogue that just sort of dominated the page. And I wasn't very happy with it. And over time, people kept hammering me to like, you know, you can let the art carry the story. You don't have to say everything out loud. And that was the, the big lesson I learned from comics. I just wrote a new thing that, again, is an NDA. I can't talk about it. But a lot of a lot of that I was able to cut out tons of verbiage because I know the artist is good and I know the images will carry the story. That's I learned from Kubrick too. Kubrick is an image guy and you don't always have to have tons of dialogue. You can follow the images and, and follow the story that way in uh, good Kubrick. And it's the same thing in good comics. So I'm trying to teach my teach myself to unwrite comics to let as much to say as little uh, as possible and to let the story be what it is without yammering all the time. And that's a funny thing to do for a prose writer is to say, well, I should just stop writing and let, let the pictures do the work. So that took a while to learn. Yeah, I guess particularly for a minimalist it's almost like the ultimate exercise in less is more yes exactly exactly but it's a great thing to to learn to you know to find out what you trust when you trust the artist you know lucifer was another one that was a lot of fun for that or i could just uh lee garbett was the artist on that i, I could just sort of step back and let go do a 
do a, a little description of a scene and let Lee carry carry the uh, carry the weight. Yeah. Of uh, what was going on, Lee was great to work with. He's doing really well right now. I'm really happy about it. Yeah, and with so many different disciplines with you, your novels, your graphic novels. I think you do some games work. There's also some teaching. I mean, how do you balance your time and projects? And what does a typical daily routine or a weekly routine, if that's easier, look like? I haven't really done game stuff. I've done some film stuff, mm. uh, none of which a lot of stuff I can't talk about. I've done film stuff mostly under the table. Mm. I have a film script called Dark West that I can talk about. That um, we have a producer, we have a director. We're now just looking for the right combination of uh, money, like everybody else, <laughs> uh, to get the thing done. But that's a that's a fun vampire slash cowboy slash car thieves story that we're putting together for that. So I've done some film stuff and I've done some under the table, you know, writing for films that people don't know about and never will. But I like to, I like to have one giant project going at any one time. And then I like one or two smaller things going so that if one gets stuck, I can hop to the other for a day or half a day. So if I'm writing a novel, it'd be, it's nice to have a little pause or I can think about a story because mm. the writing and the pacing of story writing is very different so that they can influence the story can influence the novel. The novel can influence the story. So it's nice to have those. So sometimes I'll take half a day on each. Sometimes I'll take a full day on each, whatever mentally I need at that moment. And it's, it's, it's that simple, really. I don't have any strategic plan i don't have i don't mark out my hours per day on a whiteboard or something it's just i kind of feel my way through it like what what needs to happen right now which project needs me which project needs me to walk away for a minute mm. do you have any morning routines or i guess daily rituals oh i watch too much news I, uh, I read the news on Twitter and then I go turn on the television news to see if anything happens since then. And, uh, yeah, I watch the news in the morning and it usually puts me in a foul mood. <laughs> yeah. So then I have, then I have to go do something else for, or I listen to music or something, but I, I, I'm kind of addicted to, um, reading, you know, uh, I follow CNN and, and a bunch of other places and a lot of the newspapers, Washington post, New York times on Twitter and go through their feeds. Uh, the Guardian, same thing. See what's going on in the world, and then calm down from that, and then then get to work. I need a little coffee. Um, I actually have coffee after all that because if I had <laughs> coffee before all that, I'd be wound up and never come down. Yeah, so yeah. I sort of save my coffee for a little while. Yeah, I mean the news isn't really known for its feel-good stories. You don't kind of turn on the television and it's like oh no one died today and uh, we also cured cancer is that not, yeah. <laughs> not normally that kind of thing <laughs> and the u.s right now is so fucking stupid we're in such a bad place there's like no there's not much good news happening in the in, in the united states right now little bits and pieces keep you happy but not much else we're, we're in we're such a stupid fucking country right now. <laughs> We've never been the brightest country in the world, but we're such a stupid place right now. Yeah, I, I feel you. I think we yeah. went from like just being like kind of inept college student to full blown, you know, more on redneck, you know, America. Yeah. And it's like, no, just right. no, just shut the fuck up. Yeah, no, I, 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 I think that's exactly it. I th and and to find that this New York huckster is managed to fool a lot of so much of that part of America, the cowboy, hardcore, you know, hardcore tough guys were fooled by this Ivy League New York huckster creep. Um, still makes me very sad. It's like, do 
you people have no have no self respect. No. That you're that you're gonna you know you're gonna you're gonna get your head turned by this dumb carny. No, no, apparently not. Apparently, as long as he says enough dumb stuff that makes people angry, um, it makes them that also makes them happy. So, yeah, we're an ugly place at a dumb mm-hmm. time. Yeah, it's like th- this. I, I could go on and on about it, but I will say this: it's like people like when they liked him when he was like president and everything. I was like, why do you like this guy? What, what about him? And they're like, well, I just, you know, like the bill that he says what's on his mind. I'm like, well, fuck, I do, too. And y'all like to call the police on me. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, what what the fuck, man? I mean, like, seriously, who is he says what's on his mind? OK. And most of it's dumb. But, yep. you know, let's shine a light down our throats to cure a fucking virus. And, and he doesn't he doesn't mean it. That's the carny part. He's just he's oh, a yeah. con man who understands how to appeal to a certain dumb demographic. And that's what kills me. It's like, if you actually followed, like you look at a Republican like Reagan or or Bush, it's like, okay, I hate them, but at least they believe they're bullshit. Whereas Donald Trump was angry about things he wasn't angry about. Um, he just, it was all a carny trick. Mm-hmm. He just sort of looked, looked around and it's like, well, what are, you know, what are, what are dumb people really upset about? Okay, I can latch onto that and I can remember that. He's a TV clown. Mm-hmm. So he, he knows how to do a little uh, a little song and dance about whatever he needs to. That people fell yeah. for. It. And they're still falling for it. And it's just, it's, it's so sad to be an American right now. It's very embarrassing whenever I go, I go leave the country. You know, England's the only place you can go and 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 not be mocked because like, ha ha, fuck you, breaks it. We have Trump, you have breaks it. Fuck you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's you know, and you you complain about that stuff, and people will say, well, man, you know, if you you know, well, go leave, man. If you don't like it, you can leave. I'm like, no, I'm not gonna leave. You know why? Because we can do better. I want to be part yeah. of that group that does better. Yeah, that's that's where I'm coming from. I want to. We can all do better than this yeah right. well now that we've got the high blood pressure part of the <laughs> podcast <laughs> done let's move on to something lighter and let's talk a little bit about the coop novels and i love you know the oh. humor that you have in those i mean these are hilarious laugh out loud novels so i mean what was kind of the inspiration behind them I wanted to write something that was exactly the opposite of Sandman Slim. So how far can I go? As far as I took Sandman Slim in, in, into darkness, how far can I go taking this other book into somewhere lighter and funnier? And honestly, to show people like, you know, I don't just write horror. I just, I can also write this weird kind of funny stuff, not funny Terry Pratchett kind of a way. Um, funny in an, well, I think it's kind of an LA American kind of, kind of pulp humor. And so I really enjoyed, uh, I, I really enjoyed writing the Coop books. They were miserable failures in terms of sales. That's why you're not going to see any more of them, but they were a lot of fun to do. Yeah. Well, I mean, like you said before, I mean, I guess commercial success and, talent or artistic success don't don't always or often don't go together you know you've got to have luck you've got to appeal to a certain zeitgeist and guess people just weren't fucking ready for coop is what it comes down to yeah they weren't ready for coop from me i mean i i sometimes thought i should have done it under a pseudonym or, or do it the way Ian Banks did his science fiction versus his literary novels. You know, do it as stick an initial in there to go. This is different. This isn't the same. I, sh- I should have just used a pseudonym. Tried yeah. it that way. I was dumb. I don't fucking know about that. I mean, I see the logic. I see why people do it. But I also think, look, we're multifaceted human beings. We have different modes. We have different likes and tastes and aesthetics and. You know, it's a different fucking book. If it was 
a Sandman Slim novel, then it would be called a fucking Sandman Slim novel. It isn't. Yeah. So I, yeah. I don't know. It, it, it's very bizarre sometimes how people don't want to read what what they would enjoy if it was by another author. Why they expect you to to you know play the same note over and over again as if you're the literary equivalent of Motorhead. Well, that's the thing. I mean, it's not just in writing. You see it in all art. You know, um, somebody does something and then they do something else and people hate them for it. You know, a band tries a different sound for an album and people just try to kill them. Or, or somebody from the band does a solo project that doesn't sound like the band. People hate them for it. Because people, mm -hmm. as much as they say they want novelty, they want the same thing over and over and over again. Um, and a lot of people, not everybody, but enough people that, you know, I know musicians and I know other artists that, that just, it, it, it can feel like a trap sometimes. It's like, yay, we have success. And now we're kind of in this little box and we have to be careful what we do next. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like you know, with Andy and, Kaufman and Tony Clifton, you know? I think that Tony Clifton was invented because Andy got bored. And when Tony got really popular or started to get popular, then that's when Andy said, you know what? I'm going to turn Andy into the asshole now. I, I actually got to meet Tony Clifton once. He came to San Diego Comic-Con. And he was as wonderfully abusive <laughs> to <laughs> everyone as you uh, wanted Tony Clifton to be. He was there in his suit, his ill-fitting suit, with a blonde babe on each arm, and like a real glamour babe, and just wandered around insulting everyone. And I, I would love to, I should have followed him around to see how many people had any idea who this guy was. Because he didn't announce himself. You just, you either recognized him or you didn't. And it was just wonderful. It was wonderful to see him there doing, not holding back at all, not holding back and not being, not being a jerk in the way you would expect some people to be a jerk that I've run into at science fiction conventions. You know, you run into those jerks who are there to mock people. Maybe mm -hmm. someone's dressed as Wonder Woman and they're a little overweight. And there's a the kind of person that's going to mock that other person's happiness. And you just want to punch those people. I got into a fight once on a panel with some guy in the audience who was trying to do that. Luckily, I was able to shut him down. But you never do that stuff at a convention. You don't do that stuff in life. But Tony's insults were purely life insults. They were just, they were, they were Tony and Andy, Tony Clifton, Andy kind of insults of just to the world, to existence. And that would have been a, cool to see. <laughs> it was a lot of fun. He was one of my favorite celebrity um, sightings. I should have asked him for an autograph just to see what would happen. Because I'm sure it would have come out with some sort of hideous, uh, hideous insults that, 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 would have been, uh, that would have been fun for me to have forever. <laughs> but I didn't. I just, I just watched him go around um, watched him go around the con for a few minutes. Seeing some people smile and other people's <laughs> just cringe. Yeah, which is pretty much an appropriate reaction to Tony Clifton. <laughs> to Tony Clifton, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. No, I should have had a Tony Clifton. I should have, uh, that's what I should have done with the Coop books. I should have, uh, I should have made up a Tony Clifton. That was my mistake. Right. Well, I mean, speaking of that, do you think if you try something that is too far removed from, I guess, the aesthetic you're known from? Do you think you will go for a pseudonym? I don't know. Uh, I honestly don't know right this minute. Basically, <clears throat> I've written 20 books. I'm very proud. I mean, I'm happy with Stark. I'm proud of that series. But I'm also proud of some of the other work I've done that wasn't Stark related. Again, none of which sold very well. I wrote a young adult novel called Dead Set that I'm very happy with. I wrote a second world fantasy called The Grand Dark mm -hmm. that I'm very happy with. Neither of those sold. I'm happy to have written them. I'm happy that they're under my own name because 
I think they, even though they're very different, they represent my point of view. I'm just hoping over time that people come to discover them. And there's not much more I can do. You know, they're in print. Yeah. And hope that uh, people will discover them along the way. And I, right now, I don't have any ideas that are so different. I don't have any coop kind of ideas mm. where, I'd run behind, where I'd run and hide from it. Right. So right now it's all me. And uh, yeah, I wish The Grand Dark had taken off a bit. That w- I would like to have written a, uh, a sequel to that, but it doesn't look like it's going to happen. It's perfectly set up for a sequel, but uh, a second book, which I had kind of mapped out. But, you know, that's... That's showbiz, man. You know, it's like the first one didn't make money. Mm. No one wants. No one wants the second one. That's gonna. That's not gonna make money either. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, to now be done with Stark. I mean, does that feel scary? Does that feel liberating? Is it a combination of the two? Absolutely a combination. Because I'm kind of reinventing myself. Um, yeah. I mean, people know me for Stark for the most part and I'm hoping to come at them with something new that they'll enjoy as much and I don't know I have some proposals out I'm working on a new one right now just because it kind of hit me in the last couple of days that I should do this thing that no one's asked for it's just like oh you know what I have this idea I think I'll do it Mm. so so yeah it's a combination of being feeling happy that I left the series in a good place. I'm happy with where I left Stark and the, and the other characters. And then there's, you know, there's that nervousness of like, how do I, what do I do to move on from here? That will make myself and make my readers happy. So that's what I'm working on right now. Trying to figure that out. And I have some horror. Like I said, I have uh, some horror stuff in the works. I have The Dead Take the A-Train, which is definitely horror. Mm. And we'll just see what happens from here. Like like Sam and Slim, I couldn't have predicted what's going to happen with that. I cannot predict what will happen with any of this other material. I just hope people like it. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, even though we spoke about luck before, I mean, it's... It's funny how the harder you work, the more things you put out into the world, the more you kind of up your odds of getting lucky. And it certainly sounds like, yeah, you've got a lot of different things going on. So you just got to throw things and hope that something sticks. That's kind of what you have to do. I mean, you just, again, it's taking chances. You have to keep taking chances. You have to keep pushing yourself a bit. You know, it's like, you know, I could have kept going with Stark. I could have done more Sandman Slim, but so I didn't. It's like, you know what? The story's done. Yeah. This is, this is Stark's story. And I'm happy where I left. I'm happy to have left at book 12. Because I thought of it as two, two arcs of six books. Mm. Um, and with a series like that, I always thought of it as like, I, I, I don't want to write 15 of these and have people be sick of them. It's like it's like you don't want to be the last person at a party, right? Where everyone just just wants you to shut up and go home. You want to you want to leave while people are still happy to see you. Mm. And so, Stark uh, put Stark to bed, and I think I think in a good way. I I'm pretty happy with how the last book turned out. Yeah, and I mean, as this is a horror fiction podcast, at least in name, what do you think your most overtly horror story is, whether that's a short story, a novel, a graphic novel, whatever it is? Probably anything I've written for Ellen Datlow. Ellen always challenges me with story concepts. You know, she'll say, she'll call me up and say, write a doll story for me. Ah, yeah. what? What? I don't know anything about dolls. It's like, well, write a horror, write a doll horror story for me, and we'll see what 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 comes up. And in the end, 
you know, uh, for instance, that doll horror story I wrote called Ambitious Boys Like You. I'm happy with that. And it's pretty, it's a pretty horrible story. And I've written other stuff for Ellen that's along those lines. I, I, I did a new one for her for her monsters anthology. I'm like, write a monster. Well, what the hell's a monster? It's like, well, that's for you to decide. Yeah. <laughs> so anything, anything I've had, any, uh, pretty much any Ellen, Ellen Datlow anthology makes me happy. And I think ambitious boys like you in, in the, uh, in her doll anthology is a good example of just straight up pure horror of me taking a step back from start, which kind of, walked that line between urban fantasy and horror and mm. just went to straight horror the two writers i think of when i'm writing horror not, not that i think of when i'm writing horror but when i hit a wall when i have that moment of like i'm writing what i know is horror and it's like what's the next thing it's like i, I don't have the next image i don't have the next scene i don't have the next thing that this story needs to, to keep to keep propelling itself forward. Two people I come back to are Clive Barker and Joe Lansdale. Mm -hmm. And it's like, if I think about them for a few minutes, what would Clive Barker or Joe Lansdale do at this moment? Always breaks me through. I think they're such solid writers in very different ways that those two inspire me a lot. Stephen Graham Jones also, but the, the two big ones in my brain when I think, when I'm stuck, like what the hell would these guys do are uh barker and lansdale Lansdale's just a great writer i mean they both are in, again in different ways but they've both done terrific work in different genres oh yeah i mean lansdale he could write a, a shopping list and make it interesting he'd be absolutely hooked mm -hmm. absolutely absolutely yeah, from, from the get-go. I think the first thing of his was the drive-in, his first book. Uh, it was at least the first book that people talked about. It's the first one I remember people going, have you heard of this damn thing? It's crazy. So that was my introduction to uh, Joe Lansdale. I know he wrote a lot of thrillers during that time, too. Yeah, yeah. And I know with him, whenever you ask kind of about genre and what he's doing, he's like, my genre is the Joe Lansdale genre. <laughs> you know, that's yes, it. He exactly. refuses mm -hmm. to, to be put in any sort of box. Yeah, I have this new book of Happ and Leonard stories right now that I'm uh, going to blur very soon. And I mean, those are as far from the drive-in as you can, you know, as you can get. You wouldn't know it's the same writer necessarily. Yeah. But it's still Lansdale. <laughs> but it's all Lansdale. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Lansdale, Barker, and Jones are amongst our favorites at This Is Horror. I mean, I think that they're amongst the best writers, you know, full stop. Yeah. That's it. That's the sentence. Uh, I don't always read things in order, so I'm actually reading Stephen Graham's Jones, The Least of My Scars, right now. Mm. And that's been out for years, I guess. But I, I, I missed it, and a friend mentioned it to me, so I'm, I'm, I'm reading it right now and enjoying it a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good one. That was uh, put out by Broken River Books. Yes, it was. Okay. Yeah. I enjoy a lot of his stuff, and it's fun to stumble across something that you had no idea was out there. That's always a treat. Yeah, and going back to the kind of time when The Least of My Scars was out, I mean... You put out a book via a Razorhead Press, Angel Scene. I oh, don't my God. You know, yeah, that's I, very funny. I, I forget about that book sometimes. Yeah, I don't know if you want to talk about it, but the thing that I'm sure. particularly interested in is the way in which you compiled it, because this was very much an experiment. So can you tell yeah. us a little bit about some of the self-imposed rules that you you know, had while you were writing Angel Scene? I was at a point in my life, I'd written enough, there was a lot of stuff going on in, in both work and life at that point. I felt that my writing and my life had become very constrained. I'd become very careful. I'd become too careful in my life. Partly because I was unsure of myself, partly because I'd been involved with somebody who was a careful person 
And so I felt like I had to hide parts of my personality. I had to hide the edges of who I was. So once that relationship was over and I was out on my own and I still felt like I wasn't writing the way I could, I came up with the idea for Angel Scene. An Angel Scene, I had rules. And it was to write something that was brutal, um, physically, and overtly sexual. Uh, because both of those things for me had become kind of verboten through, for various reasons, those two parts of, I wasn't, I wasn't allowed to explore those in ways I wanted to because of life circumstances. So I chose those two things. And what I did is I wrote a section a night in bed. I would just sit there with a pen and paper before I went to sleep. And I would write a section a night. I could edit the sections the next day for grammar, for language, whatever. But the rules were I couldn't change anything because they bothered me. I, the rules, one of the rules was I wanted to push myself and I wanted to see, I wanted to see if I was capable of surprising and shocking myself. That's what a lot of it was. And I wasn't able to, I wasn't allowed to take those parts out uh, as I was, as I was editing. And so I ended up with angel scene, which isn't that long. It's like nine or 10,000 words, but it's a lot of little vignettes that came together in a very weird way as purely an experiment. And then someone wanted to publish it and I was happy to have that out there in the world. Just, I was, I was happy. I was less happy about like, yeah, having, having, having it out as a book than the concept of someone liking this weird experiment enough to want to publish it. The idea of wanting it was less exciting to me than, than the book was more exciting to me than the book itself. The book is fine, but the fact that I'd written something so arch and so, so chancy that someone still wanted it, uh, made me very happy. It's a hard book. I, I don't think it's in print anymore. I don't know. It's a, uh, you can, you can find it around town very violent, very pornographic. So be prepared if you, if you do want to track it down. Yeah. And do you yeah. think in the writing of that, that kind of was cathartic in a sense after that relationship that you'd had previously that had suppressed some of these things? Yeah, it was very cathartic. It was very cathartic. It just felt like I'd, I'd broken the ice, broken through this, this ice that had hemmed me in and I was able to sort of write with my real voice again. I've never written anything as as crazy as Angel Scene again. I don't, at, certainly at this moment, I don't have any interest in writing anything as crazy as Angel Scene because I already did it. Yeah. And it broke me, it broke me out of an old pattern where I felt afraid to write certain things. So it was very useful in that sense. And yeah, I'm grateful to uh, Eraserhead Press for giving that weird little story some validation. Yeah, and in speaking about Angel Scene, we've now gone full circle and we're all the way back to confronting and facing failure and facing fear yeah. and, you know, saying yes. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, saying yes to your own demons sometimes. Mm. That's it. You know, um, challenging yourself within yourself can be as important as anything else. You know, um, don't be afraid to write what you want to write. Yeah. If it's good, it'll find it'll find an audience, maybe not a giant audience, but you'll find something out there who will find it interesting mm. and useful, perhaps. Yeah. Well, what is it that frightens you? Spiders. Spiders and Republicans. <laughs> it's a dangerous combination, man. I, I think so. Um, 
Mm-hmm. You know, I, I have I have all the regular fears of somebody. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm, I need surgery on my hip, uh, so I have all this. You know, the usual medical fears and uh, fears of uh, fears for my career, fears for relationships. You know, there's nothing special, uh, nothing particular, nothing. I don't have any. I don't have any unique fears. I think mm. um, I don't. And I don't know if that's related to to being a horror writer or not. But I have enough fears that I can use that stuff in my work. I can use what I have in the work. I've never written a spider story. Mm. I probably should, just because they just because they freak me out enough. I should probably write a story with spiders in it. Well, maybe. One year, Ellen Datlow will come knocking, and it's the Spider Anthology, yes, and finally, yes. yeah. Oh, God. Mm-hmm. That's a lot of pressure right there. But yeah, I'd write a Spider story for Ellen. Yeah. So, Ellen, if you're listening, you've heard it here. <laughs> you know what to do. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. What advice would you give to your 18-year-old self? Well, like I said, say yes to things. Say yes keep at 18 i would also say go to california sooner than you did um and don't be afraid of what you like don't be afraid of the things that interest you you know go to california i should have been in california earlier because i got to california when punk was still around but i'd love to have been there a little earlier in the scene i mean punk's punk's been around in LA for a long long time but there was like a period of punk I would like to, an earlier period of punk mm. I would like to have seen some clubs you know I, ne- I never got to go to the mask places like that I actually but you know I got to use that stuff in books I got to use the old mask club in ballistic kiss so I got to I, you know I got to visit those parts of a past I never had got to use it in fiction so that's nice but uh Tell that 18 year old to get out in the world, to get the hell away from all the things you think are inevitable, that you think you can't get past. Push through it. Get out of Texas. You can come back to Texas if you want. But get out of Texas right now. Go to California. Don't be somebody else. Be who you want to be, the person you're afraid to be in Texas. Yeah. That's it, and that's good advice for all. The problem is sometimes at that age we're so uncertain and unsure. Do we even know who we want to be? Well, I sure. I mean, I, I didn't at eighteen, but I knew who I didn't want to be, and that was right. who I was in yeah. Texas at that point. But I knew enough about uh, punk, and uh, there really wasn't a punk scene in Houston when I was a kid. There were a few. It was very fun going to uh, my first Iggy Pop show in Houston and seeing a little bitty pit <laughs> of like maybe a half dozen people up front, you know, um, dancing mm-hmm. to pogoing to Iggy. Mm. I'm like, wow, I didn't know that, that, it, that even that many people uh, in Houston were aware of this stuff. So it was uh, that was kind of delightful, but it wasn't enough to keep me in keep me in Texas. I was much happier in LA and I got to see some I got to see some great stuff in LA do some great stuff and again even in LA you know <clears throat> I had a daytime life and a nighttime life where my daytime life was um I had a job I was a young writer I was trying to figure out what I was doing but at night I could go I could go to clubs and I could explore things and be be again, closer to who I wanted to be. And it was, it was always the night where I kind of felt myself come out. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so I would go to see shows by myself. Friends didn't, friends didn't even know about it. Cause I'd be going out when they were all asleep, going to clubs and stuff like that. Cause I didn't want to explain myself to people. I hate explaining myself. It's one thing to ask, Oh, what are you into? Uh, here's what I'm into. Well, ex- you know, explain what that means it's like, i don't want to this is this is what i like here's why i think it's good that's all you need to know i don't want to explain myself and so yeah so i was i was i had two lives for a long time and now i don't have to do that anymore yeah well that's liberation right there 
Yeah. Well, this has been absolutely fascinating. So we really do appreciate you spending the majority of your evening chatting with us. This has been fucking fun, man. Thank you. Oh, it's been a lot of fun. I really appreciate it. Thanks for asking me. I really had a good time. Where can our listeners connect with you? Um, The two, probably, well, I'm, I'm on Twitter, Richard, Richard underscore Kadri. I'm on Facebook, but not that much anymore. I think that's Richard Dot Kadri. And I'm on Instagram at R Kadri. And those are the three basic places, mostly Twitter and, and Instagram these days. Mm-hmm. All right. Do you have any final thoughts to leave our listeners with? Love what you love. Go do what you want to do. Um, be brave. Be, be brave with yourself and be nice to yourself, too. Say yes, even if that means sometimes walking away from things. You can say yes to go ahead, but maybe sometimes you go too far. So don't be afraid to back off and come at it again. Take care of yourself. Thank you so much for listening to The Conversation with Richard Kadri. Join us again next time where we'll be chatting with Jared Barbie of Death's Head Press. But if you want to get that ahead of the crowd, if you want to get every episode ahead of the crowd, including conversations with Kat McGuera and Toby Harvard, the writer of The Greasy Strangler, and Come to Daddy, then become our patron at patreon.com forward slash this is horror. Loads of perks, loads of goodies, and you're supporting the This Is Horror podcast. So check it out at patreon.com forward slash this is horror and see if it's a good fit for you. Before I wrap up, a little bit of an advert break. Malene by Josh Schlossberg from DT Publishing. The absent mindedness, the nonsensical ramblings, the blank stares. Ward heirs, physically disabled and confined to his Jersey Shore home, can only watch in dismay as his beloved wife Malene slips further and further into dementia. Until finally, Ward uncovers a dark force behind Malene's decline and must plumb the depths of sacrifice and selfishness to reclaim his wife and preserve humanity's future. Find Malene in paperback, hardcover, ebook, or audiobook online or at a bookstore near you. Being an independent publisher, we are just like you. We share the same passion, the same love for horror fiction. We believe in the incredible work being created unnoticed by the mainstream and we want to share it with the world we are the sinister horror company as always i would like to end with a quote and i have really been delving into stoicism lately it has been awfully helpful during this really turbulent time that I'm going through. This is, in some ways, the worst time of my life. But, you know, I'm persisting and having the stoic wisdom has been helping me to get through and really putting things into perspective. So here is a little quote from Marcus Aurelius. Let us prepare our minds as if we'd come to the very end of life. Let us postpone nothing. Let us balance life's books each day. The one who puts the finishing touches on their life each day is never short of time. I'll see you in the next episode with Jared Barbie. But until then, take care of yourselves, be good to one another, read horror, keep on writing, and have a great, great day. This is Horror Podcast.